Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, I'm still Judy, and I still have alcoholism. I want to thank Kat for asking me to share my experience, strength, and hope. It's always a privilege to participate in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and specifically Prime Time, which is very close to my heart. And uh, happy birthday, Jose and Dawn. It's so beautiful uh, to celebrate sobriety. You know, it's such a gift. My sobriety date is January 10th, 2002. I have a sponsor, and I sponsor many women, and my home group is Tuesday Night Primetime at Radford Hall. Radford girl, I got sober there 11 years ago, and, um, you know, I, I'm really grateful today for my life, and uh, that's not something I could have said 11 years ago. You know, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get into any, you know, I, I qualify because I'm here, by the way. I don't really need to get into all that. You know, y'all know how to drink and use and how to party it up, and, and there's no need to get into all of that. Um, you know, but the thing I definitely want to qualify about for me, long before I ever picked up a drink, and I really believe the reason that drinking became such a powerful tool in my life is that I was restless, irritable, and discontent coming out of my mother's womb. I was not vibing this place called Earth. It was not my scene. I was just not feeling it. And at five years old on the playground, as everybody's engaging in, you know, uh, I, I never liked children, even when I was one. I was always seeking to be around adults because children made me feel very disturbed and unsafe because they're very unpredictable. They're like little animals, you know, they're very unpredictable, you know. And uh, that made me feel really uncomfortable because this alcoholic likes, you know, control. And you can't control what's unpredictable, you know, like small animals and small children, right? So I don't like that. And even when I was one, I didn't like that. And I wanted to always be around people, you know, way older than me that always made me feel safe. But that feeling of impending doom and anxiety and fear was in me always. And I didn't know what that was until I was 12 years old. And I had that first drink. And in that moment, all of a sudden, I felt a peace that I had never known. I didn't even know it was after that kind of peace until I experienced it, right? And I, that was my first spiritual experience was Boone, Strawberry Hill, and, and uh, Thunderbird on the rock, right? That was my first spiritual experience because for the first time in my life, I felt okay and peaceful. And I was like, oh, man, from, from this day forward, right, like this is my commitment is to have alcohol in my life. And I was really excited about it. And it worked for a really long time until it stopped working. And, um, you know, if it was still working, I wouldn't be here. You know, I'd be on a bar stool at the Ritz-Carlton sipping a 12-year-old scotch on the rocks. I wouldn't be talking with y'all, okay? Because, uh, you know, life ain't easy. And this is not for the faint of heart. Life on life's terms, you know? Uh, I'm not a big fan of, like, just saying, you know, I, I, this mind of mine, uh, you know, you guys see me in a lot of service. It's, it's not because I'm Mother Teresa. It's because if I'm not in service, it's very painful for me. When it's quiet, it's really painful for me, you know. And uh, I got to either get into a lot of prayer and a lot of meditation and a lot of God, or I need to get into a lot of service, or I get into a lot of pain. I'm just not a fan of this place. You know, I wasn't one of those people who's like, Woohoo, it's club. You know, that's not me. That is not me. Okay, I'm not a fun person. My brother jokes and says I have permatwig inserted in my bootay because I'm uptight and I'm stressed out and I'm a very serious person. And I was like that from day one. And it's really hard for me to have a good time. So it wasn't for me. Alcohol wasn't like at the club. It was like just to not want to put a knife in my throat. That's what drinking was about for me. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I share this for those of you that are new, that are in pain. You know, you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not the only one who feels that way. We all have our own version of this. You know, no one tries to kill themselves slowly with drugs and alcohol unless they're in some level of pain about something, whatever it is, right? And you may not be in touch with your pain. You might be very far removed from it because, you know, however traumatizing the trauma was, the more we try to get away from that to not have to experience that. But, you know, we all have that pain, which is why we're all here, right? Because if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have drank or used to that extent. And, um, 
in any case, you know, that's that's just a little bit about how the disease manifests in this alcoholic's life, right? You know, it's in my mind. It tells me that I'm not okay and you're not okay and it's not okay. And I can't be with the way that it is and I can't be with the way that it isn't. So if I'm not drunk, I'm just in a lot of pain. And that's how life occurs for this alcoholic, you know? So for me, step one, one of the greatest things in Alcoholics Anonymous when I came in here was I got that, okay, I'm powerless over alcohol and my life is unmanageable. And that was easy for me to get because I knew I was an alcoholic pretty much from the gate because I don't think anybody has that level of dramatic, uh, you know, response to a drink that I had. And, like, I knew in that moment when I was having that experience drinking that drink that, that I was an alcoholic, like, in that moment. It's like love at first sight and that commitment that it's me and you from now on. Like, that level of marital commitment to my drink from the first moment at 12 years old, I knew something was wrong with that picture, right? And um, so that wasn't a hard concept for me. But for me, I want to take it a step further on step one. I'm powerless over life. See, whoever God is or whatever God is or nature, higher power, whatever you guys want to call it, that designed this world and the laws and the way it all operates, see, I don't agree with him. And I don't like how he set it up. (laughs) You know, it just doesn't work for me. I don't like where I was born and who I was born to and how it all went down and, you know, how Dawn was sharing about the stupid people. And, you know, I just don't like that, right? And so then when I try to control that which I have no power over, my life gets really unmanageable. You know what I mean? Like when I try to reconstruct my past or when I try to fix you and them and it and, you know, all that jazz, right? You know, it gets really chaotic and unmanageable because I can't make, you know, a round ball into a square peg. I just can't. I can't be a cat because I'm a person, right? I just don't have those kind of magical powers, right? And I'm really upset about that. And that's another reason I drink is because I don't like to do life on life's terms. I don't like who I am. I don't like how this life is. I don't like any of it. I'm really upset about it. And I don't want to be here. So, you know, it's really, and, but I'm like, you know, I really don't want to kill myself either too much. I mean, I I don't want to be here, but I really don't want to kill myself. So the, the really great alternative to that is just to be so obliterated that I don't have to feel, you know, for me, for this alcoholic. And uh, that was a really good solution. But when it stopped working, you know, I remember very clearly when I first stopped drinking, and this is my third sobriety. It took me a couple of times because, you know, they say it's a hard message to hear. I couldn't hear it when I first came in. I just, I was so traumatized and so, like, raw nerves. I just couldn't hear it. I came in 18 years old, 72 days clean, DTs shaking, freaked out in my mind, and I just couldn't hear what was being said. You know, and I hung out for a couple of years, and I stayed dry out of fear, you know, and out of, uh, you know, whatever, panic and my doctor's recommendation because my liver was protruding out of the side of my little 18-year-old body, and I was having some problems health-wise, right? So it was a good idea to lay off the booze for a minute. But, uh, you know, I but I didn't want to be here, you know? And, um, and I remember thinking to myself, like, wow, how am I going to survive? Like, what am I going to do? I can't be with people. I, can't, I don't know how to be with you. I remember being in school and, like, being with kids or being with a teacher, and I couldn't be with it. I was in trouble. I was kicked out. I don't know how to be with people. I don't know how to be, period. I don't know how to do things. You give me instructions I can't hear. You have to tell me 17 times. I'm so uncomfortable all the time, you know. And alcohol, man, was the only way that I could be okay And when that got taken away, I really didn't know how it was going to turn out. And I really didn't know if it was possible. You know, I was pretty freaked out. I was pretty scared. And, um, you know, I did it dry for a couple of years the first time. I don't recommend it. You know, uh, I I came in here uh, just because I didn't know where else to go and I didn't know what else to do. And I I heard of something called Alcoholics Anonymous, and I walked in, uh, you know, like I said, and I didn't hear anything, but I kind of hung out because I had nowhere else to go and I was scared. And then, uh, you know, a couple of years into that game of just sort of hanging out socially and fellowshipping and not reading the book and not getting a sponsor and not working a step, ultimately the day came when I drank again. You know, I was in another country. Somehow I thought that would make it okay. (laughs) 
<laughs> another really fascinating component of my alcoholic mind, right? I thought that would somehow make it okay because I was in Germany and it was Dom Perignon and I've never had that and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm, I'm 21, almost 22-ish. I'm a woman of the world now. I'm not a little girl anymore. You know, that lost 18-year-old, so now maybe I can handle it, right? And, you know, it was interesting. I'll never forget when I took that drink again, breaking that for sobriety, and I was waiting for, like, dun, 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 you know, the sky to open or something, and nothing happened, and I thought, oh, I got away with it. And, uh, you know, I drank like a lady for the first couple of months, but then, as it says in the big book, right, the prophecy came true, but then followed by still worse, you know, uh, incompre- incomprehensible, pitiful demoralization, and, you know, bo- within a six-month period, I was back to, you know, falling down drunk, throwing up, drunk dialing, you know, all the sexy, beautiful things I do when I drink, you know, uh, driving drunk, it's a miracle I'm not in prison for the rest of my life, you know, because I should have been, uh, all the things that I they didn't get caught doing, you know, driving and all that kind of stuff, endangering my life and others, because, you know, I don't care about my life or yours, I don't value life when I'm in this disease, I don't. And that's the truth. And, uh, you know, it's a painful truth because you come here and then all the fantasy gets taken away, right? You've got to look at yourself and the cynicism and the resignation and the misery and the trauma and the mind power to disease and the twisted way that I see life. You know, the twisted way that I hear things and the twisted way that I see you and me, all of that, right, gets revealed. And that's why I need a power. Because me in my own power inside of alcoholism, I can't do this. It's not a possibility for me. It's really not. I don't have the power to be able to face life on life's terms one day at a time without a higher power. It's no way. I can't do it. I promise you. So when I came here and I really got that I'm powerless over alcohol, and by the way, I'm powerless over life, period, you know, can't really do much about that, and if I try to change it, it becomes unmanageable. Maybe, just maybe, there's a power that's greater than me, right? Like that power that made the sun come up this morning, the power that has the birds and the trees and life happening, right, and the earth spinning on its axis. Maybe, just maybe, that power, if I connect to that power, maybe, just maybe, it'll be okay for me. But then now we have a whole other problem because, you know, I hate that power. Because, you know, it's that power that gave me this life and that made this world the way it is. So I'm a double-edged sword when I walk into this room. Because I, I, I need this power, but I hate this power. I don't trust him and I'm angry with him because don't you know you gave me these parents that I didn't want and the father that I never met and this lousy life and this sh- crappy disease, you know, all this stuff. And now i got to trust you when you screwed me? It just gets better, right? <laughs> it was just not happening for me when I walked in there. I was not excited about it. But I really had to get busy living or get busy dying. You know? I mean, that was just the bottom line. It's sort of like, you know, use the toilet or get off the toilet, right? You know, like stop playing this game of one toe in and one toe out. Like make a decision. And so I finally said, okay, well, maybe I'll just, you know, give this power a chance. Maybe it's all a big misunderstanding on my part. Like, I'll take that into consideration. And maybe, just maybe, there is a power that can restore me to sanity. And, you know, one of the things I share, actually, there was a a gentleman that uh, used to go to Radford who had grave mental illnesses and tattoos, like fainting on his throat, and just looked like a really scary person from prison. You know, I'm this little stockbroker from Sherman Oaks, right? Here comes this dude who looks all scary out of jail or something. And I heard him share from the podium, right? And I was brand new in sobriety, and I'm going through all these struggles, right? And he comes up to the podium, and and he makes my life look like Disneyland, by the way. If you hear about his story, it's like, wow, I have no anything to be upset about, right? And I'm listening to his share, and I realized in that moment, wow, you know, if that guy, if this program did that for him, then I'm good. You know what I mean? Because I'm not that, you know, to that point, right? I'm not to that extent of trauma or abuse or background. So it gave me a tremendous amount of hope. So coming to meetings and listening to other people share and seeing other people's stories helped me to have faith and hope that, you know, step two was a possibility for me, that I could be delivered out of my really dark place that I was in, you know, when I came into this place. And then I was able to make the decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood him. And for me, and still to this day for me, how God really manifests itself is through the principles. You know, today I live a principle-based life. I don't live a life today that's based on my feelings or opinions. You know, which is, by the way, the only way I can 
you stay sober and the only way I can live life because we want to start talking about how I feel about things and my opinions. We should just leave now. <laughs> it is not a good place to check. You know, I know about y'all, maybe some people own oh, after 11, 20 years, they, that, that, changes for them. It doesn't change for me. Like I have a moment by moment reprieve based on my spiritual condition in that moment. If I'm with the power in that moment and I'm, I'm living the principle in that moment, I'm okay in that moment. Right. But then the next moment, if I'm not with that, I'm miserable again. It's that fast. It's that fast for me. I'm one of those, you know, the depressive type, you know, like that's, that's where I go. I get into that really like doomsville kind of a place. So for me, it's really important for me to be able to cling on to the principle. That's the only thing that gets me out of that drowning quicksand is that, you know, when my mind starts telling me all these lies, you know, my mind speaks to me in my voice and speaks to me with great authority and tells me really scary stories. And if I believe the scary stories that my mind tells me about whatever it is, like the past, guilt, remorse, and shame, or the future, how it's not all going to work out, that's what's then going to fuel my, my alcoholism and my, my insanity, right? So I have to remember the principle. You know, in this moment, what's my intention? You know, I'm here to be of service in this moment, whatever this moment is, whether I'm at work and I'm with clients, whether I'm, you know, at the grocery store, whether I'm with friends, whatever I'm doing, I'm there to empower and enable whoever I'm around to have a good experience and just to be of service because it's not about me anymore. You know, and when I remember that and I engage in the principle and I come from that place, which is for me what step three looks like in an application, then I have a good experience when I take self out of the picture. But the moment I bring self into the picture, it's all over because you will never measure up to my standards, ever, ever, you know, and I will just kill you all off and that will be the end of it, <laughs> right, and then I'll be alone which I'm fine with me, right? You know, like just get me alone enough and then Jack Daniels will look really, you know, enticing and then I'll be pour me, pour me, pour me another drink and that's how that's how it works for me, for this alcoholic, right? Because see, if I'm not going to engage in society, I don't need principles and I don't need Alcoholics Anonymous because I'll just be in my cave and then no one's going to mess with me and I'll be fine, right? I need this stuff to engage in living in the world because guess what? When I get in my car, I'm engaging with other people on the freeway. When I walk into Ralph's, I'm engaging with people in the grocery store. When I walk into a meeting, I'm around all y'all, right? Like my family, there's no way to be here and escape being around people. And I'm powerless over people, places, and things. And I can't control you, and it just kills me. Right? Because, I mean, I'm hypersensitive, self-centered, self-righteous to the extreme, and I want you to do it my way. And don't you know I know the best way to do it? If you would just listen to me, the actor, it would all turn out splendid. Right? That's just how it looks for this alcoholic, right? So, you know, for me, if I, if I want to be of service and I want a happy life and I want to get along and actually have a good experience or i got to learn how to be with people because there's people on planet Earth, about six billion of us, right? And i got to not let what you do or don't do ruin my life. And that's hard for me. It's so hard for me, man. Codependency is at the center of all addiction, right? And for me, you know, how I feel can be so dependent on what you're thinking or what you're doing if I'm not with the power in that moment. And then when you don't do it my way, it's just, you know, trauma recapitulation right back to the past, right back to my father who never showed up, or right back to my mother who didn't do this, or blah, blah, blah. You know, all the betrayals, all the passages, all gets triggered. And it's like reliving this nightmare right in my mind. And it's just horrible. So exciting. You know, this life I have as an alcoholic, but there's a solution, and that's bringing the power in that moment to whatever's going on. Like, wow, okay, so this person is doing whatever this person is doing, and it doesn't mean whatever I'm making it mean in that moment. You know, if you don't want to be with me, it's not because I'm worthless and unlovable, which is, by the way, what my disease will tell me. If you don't show up for me, that's evidence of my worthlessness and unlovability. That's why I want to stab you in the face when you don't show up for me. <laughs> Right, because you might say, like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't be there tonight. What I'm hearing is you're worthless and unlovable, and I don't care about you. That's what I'm hearing. Right, dun, 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 dun. And then, you know, it's revenge, and, you know, I'll show you. It's, that's the insanity of alcoholism. That's the insanity of alcoholism, right? You know, I want to control because I don't ever want to feel vulnerable and powerless and like that small little child again. I don't ever want to feel that way again. Ever, ever, ever. So, again, for me, the only solution is, is to bring my higher power and to bring a loving God into every moment. And remember that we're all God's children, 
this whole thing called Judy or this body, this skin sack, whatever, isn't real. You know, I'm here for me on a spiritual journey, and I'm here to have an experience, and I'm here to develop the gifts that God has given me and make those manifest on this time to do God's work well, not mine. This is not my vacation at the Ritz-Carlton for Judy party time. That's not why God sent me here, you know. So I'm not, right, like, i got to look why am I here. And i I got to ask myself, and this is just for me, not am I having a good time or is this going my way. For me, that's danger zone red flag question. Because that's going to just empower my alcoholism to start getting all up in your business, right? i got to ask myself in every moment, whether it's, you know, in a romantic setting or whether it's in a friendship setting or whether it's in a work setting, is how am I being of service in this moment? Period. Any other question I ask myself, it's not going to go well, I promise you. You know, that's my red flag. So for me, you know, i got to, you know, we talk about here in prime time about watching the thoughts that surf the waves of our brain. Right, and taking a look at, you know, what's going on and where am I coming from and what is my intention. You know, i got to learn how to be present and watch my mind and see how alcoholism in any given moment is trying to kidnap me. You know, alcoholism in any given moment is just trying to do whatever it's trying to do, right? It's infected my ego and it comes in and it's trying to make things comfortable for me. It doesn't care about you. It just wants me. Actually, not even me. It's pretending to be me. It just wants itself to be comfortable, right? It's my ego has one intention, to protect itself, defend anything that opposes it, you defend itself against anything that opposes it, and destroy anything that threatens it. You know, and it's not even me. I'm not my ego. You hear me say, my name is Judy, and I have alcoholism. I have an ego. I have a body. I have a disease called alcoholism, but it's not who I am. Who I am is a soul and a spirit that can never die. That's an emanation of the divine, perfect, total, and complete. That's who I am, right? That's the only truth about me. And I'm having this physical experience on this planet, right? And i got to learn how to be here and go through this process to learn whatever there is to learn and contribute whatever there is for me to contribute while I'm here. But I get in this little narcissistic trip about, well, God, you know, maybe this is my vacation and I should just have fun, right, you know, and try to get in some trouble instead of being here on my mission and purpose for what I'm here for, you know? And i got to always remember to develop the talents and gifts that God has given me, that my higher power has given me, and be the best Judy that I can be. You know, I'm not anybody else. You know, like I said, I can never be a cat. You know, I can only be who I am. But this alcoholic has spent her whole life trying to be something else. You know? Like, I didn't want to be this. I wanted to be that. I didn't want to do this profession. I wanted to do that profession. You know, I didn't want to be born to these people. I wanted to be born to those people. I wanted that life, not that, you know? That's my alcoholism, always wanting whatever it is that's not what I have. Always. So I've got to learn also in this program, right? Acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. I've got to learn how to be grateful for what I have. You know, be grateful for what I have. Be grateful for the gifts that God did give me and utilize those things to make an impact for myself and for others. Not be sitting here wasting my diamonds because they're not emeralds. Oh, let me just throw the diamonds away because they're not emeralds, you know? No, that's insane, right? i got to focus on what's been given me and be grateful for that and start getting busy utilizing that. That's what's going to make a difference for me in my life and give me peace of mind. And when I found... Very paradoxically, which was such a stunning revelation for this alcoholic, that self-esteem for me didn't come from, you know, accolades, you know, people adoring me or whatever. Because you see very many famous movie stars or wealthy people, executives, whoever they may be, that had all that, right? They had fortune and fame and beauty and people killing themselves for them. And, you know, they're six feet under right now. They're not here with us tonight. So if, if... narcissism, you know, was the solution, and hedonism, right, if having everybody worship you was the solution, then none of those people would be dead right now, right? They'd all be engaged in that. But that's that's not the solution, right? So for me, what I learned is that self-esteem comes from a esteemable ass, and if I'm a crack hoe and a liar to cheat and a thief, I'm going to feel like crap about myself unless I'm a sociopath, right? And if I'm doing good things and I'm being honest and I'm being of service and I'm being loving and kind, I'm going to feel good about myself. It's not brain surgery. It's very simplistic. You know, when I'm kind and loving and generous, again, living by the principle, I can lay my head on the pillow and I feel good about myself. When I'm a self-righteous, grouchy, you know what, I don't feel good about myself. You know? So, again, self-esteem comes from esteemable acts, and life is not about me getting mine. 
you know, which is what my obsession was my whole life, was where am I going to get mine? Because don't you know how robbed I was? I was robbed of that childhood and that loving father and that loving family. I was robbed with my little face pressed up against the glass, watching everyone else's life. And I'm going to get mine, you know? Like revenge almost against life, which is insane, right? But that's my alcoholism. A little five-year-old up for revenge, man. I'm going to get it wherever I can. But you know what, guys? I don't know about y'all, but I'm very masterful at getting my way, getting what I want, getting things done. Problem is, is wanting what I have once I get it. Never fixes me for more than a few moments. Right? Never fixes me. You know, I'm lucky I got everything I ever wanted by the time I was 30. You know, it was a real problem because then I was like, now what? <laughs> you know, now what? I had the executive career, the six-figure income, the house, the man worshiping me, blah, blah, blah. All the stuff I thought that was going to fix me, and I still felt like a worthless, unlovable, angry five-year-old. And I was so mad because I was so certain if I got those things, it would fix me. You know? So what I've learned that life is a paradox, that... It's not about giving, it's not about, excuse me, getting, it's about giving. When I give and I'm loving, then I experience love and fulfillment in my life. And the more that I give and I'm of service to people, the less I feel the need to take. You know, it sort of balances itself out. What I've learned also is that although I'm powerless over my alcoholism and my circumstances in my mind, I have power over that which I'm going to give power to, meaning if I have a thought, I don't have to indulge the thought. I don't have to engage the thought. I can cancel the thought. The thought comes in that says, you know, oh, let's go do X, Y, Z. And I can say, whoa, God, did you hear that? Bad idea. <laughs> you know, that fully opposes the principle, right? So I'm not going there. And I can pray about it and I can take a contrary action. You know, and I can get on my knees and pray, which I do every morning. And I don't just, I mean, I pray on my knees in the morning and I surrender myself to God. But I don't just pray in the morning or at night. I pray throughout the day, and I ask God to be with me all the time. Because I need help. I need a lot of help, you know. It's not one of those things where, oh, do to do it came to AA, and I worked the steps, and it's all good. You know, I don't know. Maybe that happened for somebody, but sure the hell didn't happen for me. First of all, I needed a treatment team. I needed a lot of outside work and help, which I did tons of and I'm still engaged in, you know, for all my life. You know, I did a lot of therapy. I did a lot of, you know, personal development seminars. I've read a ton of spiritual books and stuff. I've been on a spiritual journey. I've done a lot of things. And talks about that in the doctor's opinion, actually. Excuse me, in the family afterward. It talks about availing ourselves to practitioners of various kinds that a body badly burned by alcohol or mind badly, you know, burned by alcohol is not going to be healed overnight, you know. So we shouldn't be afraid or shy to get outside help when we're suffering. Because this is no joke. You know, we've all seen people with 10, 20 years kill themselves, you know, because I know, I don't know about for you guys, but for me, I know that that bar stool that's waiting for me isn't the solution to my problems today, you know. I mean, it's just not. I, that, that, believe me, I, I buried that, that scotch glass a long time ago because when it stopped working for me, it stopped working, and there's no turning back, and I know that. I have fully conceded to my innermost self that I am an alcoholic. I have alcoholism to my dying day, and there is nothing that's going to alter that. That is never the solution for me going forward. Jumping off a bridge, maybe, but not, not drinking. That's for sure. So if I want to have a quality of life, Again, the paradoxical living of taking this lemon and turning it into lemonade, right? Taking this curse and turning it into a gift, it's all about what I do with it. You know, I might not have a say. I might be powerless over what happened to me or wore the hand that life dealt me, but I'm not powerless over how I play the hand. You know, God gave me freedom of choice and free will. And whether I turn those lemons into lemonade and make something beautiful of my story and allow that story to make a difference for others, like it says, we will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We'll see our experience can benefit others, right? I can either allow that to play out in a way that's going to be beneficial to others, or I can stay a pissed off five-year-old for the rest of my life and just hate everyone, resent, stop my feet, and, you know, try to get my way and live that life. And I'm not interested in that. You know, I already did that, you know, before I got sober. And it just wasn't, it just didn't do the trick for me, you know. So what I can say today inside of this beautiful program, inside of Alcoholics Anonymous, and inside of having a higher power is I have something today that I never had without a drink, and that's peace. 
You know, even today when I'm having a bad day, and there's moments, I've had moments, days, hours of bliss and peace and happiness, but even in the moments when my mind is really taking a baseball bat to me, and my mind does that very frequently, even the days when my mind is taking a baseball bat to me, I know it isn't true. Sort of like when you're watching a scary movie, you know, like Chucky or something, and it's all this blood and guts, but you know it's just Hollywood, it's not real. Like, that's my mind now. It's like a scary movie, and I'm seeing the props and the fake blood, you know? Like, all the scary dun, 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 dun going on in my mind. Today, at least I know, when it's coming after me like that, God bless you, that it's not real. That's not the truth. I can differentiate and distinguish the truth from the false state, which is a miracle, because as the doctor's opinion tells me, in this alcoholic mind, I'm maladjusted to living full flight from reality and an outright mental defective. But because the grace of God has entered into my mind and soul, God bless you, and has removed from me the obsession to drink and has given me a spiritual solution, and I connect with that higher power on a moment-by-moment basis, because of that connection, that allows me to see the difference between the true and the false. And I can now see all that stuff as not real. You know, and that's why even when I'm having a bad day, I have peace. Because I know deep down in my heart it's going to be okay. You know, the rent's going to get paid, you know, I'm going to, whatever, you know, I'm going to eat. It's all going to work out. You know, the birds, you don't see them in the morning look at each other like, Charlie, how are we going to get our worms today, man? we got to hustle. We should sell some crack. You know, like, it's not like that. You know, I think I'm going to go strip for some, you know, food, pay my rent, you know, because I just don't think God's going to provide worms today as I'm flying around, you know. That's just not how it goes, you know. The birds and the cats and the dogs, the animal kingdom, they're, they wake up and they're just like, okay, let's go get dinner. And they just know, right, that the universe is going to provide that, you know. So today I know, even when I feel insane and alcoholism is attacking me, I know the truth today. And I know that it's okay. Everything is okay. And whatever I made, whatever just happened means, isn't what it means. Thank you. Okay, so, Lonnie. Hi, my name is Lonnie. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Lonnie. Um, I haven't been here for a while uh, for reasons uh, that I'm not going to share, but anyway. Uh, for the last few months, I went through these steps. Uh, almost got a year in right now. And uh, she, she, she's very helpful to me in my sobriety. She helped, she brought me into the program, and I never left the program. I really uh, depend on her uh, to uh, chew me out when I'm off track. <laughs> Sometimes I don't want to hear it, but I need to hear it. And, and I'm, I'm, going, I'm going through a uh, problem with uh, six and seven. The defect of character in uh, humbling myself. I have another counselor here that I deal with, with the VA. And uh, I pray in the morning and I meditate. I started doing that more and more because it's necessary. Because Satan is out there. I mean, as soon as you leave out your house, man, he's ready, man. He's at the door waiting for you. And I blew it on Thursday, right? Thursday. You know, I prayed in my car before I went into an open house at the VA. And I allowed myself to get caught up in some bull with one of the counselors. And I, uh, I reacted pretty bad at her. Now I got to go back and uh, apologize to her immediately on Monday because I'm trying to get to a place in my life and she's one of the obstacles. She can either deny me or let me go through what I need to go through. And and uh, it's, it's no joke, man. This thing is, I mean, it seems like the more you try to do right, the more Satan's going to come at you because he don't want you to do right. And 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 I, I, I blow this sometimes. My defects come out. It's that old man, you know. God has created a new man, a new person in us to try to walk doing his will, not ours. And sometimes we go, we go on self. 
And every time we go on self, we wreck. And I know I do. I don't know about y'all, but when I go out there on self-will, I wreck. <laughs> and I got to rely on him more and more in my life if I'm going to get ahead. I'm 54 years old. Now I got to start all over again because of uh, um, I had back surgery and a job that I used to have that was a career. I couldn't do it any longer. She knows because she's my job constant. And it's very hard for me. So God gave me a vision, and, and I'm, I'm on the mark of doing it, but these obstacles keep coming at me. Instead of me relying on my higher power, I'm relying on self. And I'm not getting nowhere. It's like I'm backing up instead of going ahead. And, and uh, the spirit that's within me convicts me of when that defects come out, a defect of character. It convicts me. And, and then I got I can't beat myself up, which I have for the last few days now, since Thursday. I've been beating myself up, plus I explained it to my daughter, and she kind of beat me up too, you know. And because uh, I talked to her too, she talked to me, you know, we have a great relationship. And, and she said, Dad, these are things that you already know. And, and you tell me, but you're not even doing it. And I said, Damn. And it's so true. You know, we got the tools. God gives us the tools to be successful as long as we're doing His will. Then we're going to go on self will. We don't have the tools to do go on self will. We got to rely and, and follow His will. And then our will will come to pass. Our will will come to pass. The things that we want, well, we will get the desires of our heart if we're on His path. Once we get off His path, we're going to wreck. We're going to wreck. And, uh, I'm getting tired of doing the same thing, man. The shortcomings, the things I should do that I don't do, and I'm tired of it. It's like it's like war up here, and I I, I, I kind of uh, talked about that a few months ago. It's still a war up here. It's going to continue to be a war up here. You know, I'm I'm gonna leave with this. It was I went to my Tuesday meeting, my man's group meeting, and uh, one of the older guys. He said, you know. Every now and then, a scout go out from the fortress, and he come back with a gang of arrows in his ass, and it let us know that the Indians are still out there on the war path. <laughs> so I can't go out there. I ain't going out that way, though. But you know, uh, I just, just thank you for letting me share, man. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you so much. I always love hearing you. You have a great message. And um, I am just, I just love prime time, you know. I love, I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and I especially love prime time because I didn't know that I was restless, irritable, and discontent from the gate, you know. And I, I didn't know even, I, I, I always say, you know, I had 10 years of sobriety and I drank again. And then, you know, when I came back, I found prime time. And, you know, when I drank again, it's because my entire 10 years of sobriety, I didn't know that this disease is in my mind and that it's killing my moments, you know. Um, I'm just, I, I live in a constant state of anxiety where I'm thinking about, you know, what happened to me in the past. And the past is not necessarily like the stories of things that happened to me when I was a kid. It's what happened to me this morning. You know, I'm mad about some situation that happened this morning. And so I'm bringing that into my day and I'm reliving an argument or, you know, some perceived slight or something. And and I'm worried about what I'm going to do later in the evening. And so I'm never where I am, you know. And when I'm, when I came into prime time, and realize that that's my alcoholism, you know, my alcoholism and my ego, I'm constantly feeling like, like you were saying, you know, that the, my, my ego wants to defend against, you know, anything that it feels is being attacked. And, you know, my ego feels attacked all the time and it, and it wants to defend. And so it's always searching for something and, and ruining my moments. And and so it it starts my alcoholism like latches on to whatever happens and it and it goes around in a loop in my head and it's painful and 
now, because of prime time, I've been able to identify that by watching the thoughts that surf the waves of my brain, and I can see when it's happening, and I can bring God into my moments, like you were talking about, and, um, you know, doing that enough, like, like, being able to say, oh my God, you know, did you see what was just happening in my mind? God, can you be with me now? I'm, I can actually feel a physical shift inside of me when my head starts to run away with me and I go, whoa, my alcoholism is doing that again. God, can you just be with me? I actually can feel like the volume turn down in my head and, and be able to wake up to the moment that I'm in. And that is such a relief because I didn't, I didn't even know that that was possible before. My ego wants to give me a problem and then wants to try to find the prob- the answer to the problem. And trying to find the answer to the problem is really painful. Like going to my mind for my solutions is just more self-talk. And now I don't have to do that anymore because the peace comes from not trying to solve my problems with my mind. The peace comes from letting go of the problem entirely and knowing that the answers will come if my own house is in order. And, um, you know, I work, I work really hard now at staying connected to God in the moment that I'm in because that's, that's where my life is, is right here, right now. So thank you so much for calling. Right. Hi, my name is Loretta. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, um, Judy, thank you so much because um, my head's kind of crazy like yours. And um, <laughs> yesterday, I had to live this program. I, um, I was so stressed from trying to get out of work and make a 10 appointment on the 405. And uh, even driving down the street, I wanted to run over the teenagers. And my ma- I was horrible. And... Um, just horrible. I was so stressed. I was crazy. I was insane. And um, I was trying to get to the DMV. I drove around for like an hour and a half, and I couldn't find it. And um, instead of looking it up and being prepared, my kids gave me directions, but they were wrong. So I hated my children. And I couldn't go home. And Oh, it was just insane. And so I kept saying, I recognized the insanity, and I kept saying, please, God, please, you know restore this power and I had to turn it over and um, usually I get a little bit crazy and then I can back it down but yesterday I was like a mad woman when I went to the instant teller I wanted someone to rob the bank so I could just jump and beat the crap out of them so <laughs> I have so much anger in me so um, this I had to back it down just just for today just in this moment just for right now you're not going to get fired from your job you're, you know, your life's not over, you don't hate your children, you know, everything's going to be okay. Right now, everything's okay. So, um, I was able to turn it over to God and be in another place. Thanks. Uh, John Alcoholic. Hi, John. Uh, um, it's good to hear you. I've never heard you, Judy. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I just wanted to come up here. And uh, happy birthday to Don and uh, Jose, right on. That's how you do it, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to come up here, talk about real quickly just about some gratitude. I'm very grateful for what I get to uh, learn here at Primetime AA, um, without the message, without the treatment, I would be totally crazy. Um, yesterday, you know, I got, I drove all over town. If I, if I wasn't, if I didn't have a power, if I wasn't getting some of this information here, I would have been totally, my day would have been screwed because the, business where I went to get some oxygen, had moved all the way to the other side, that would have ruined my moment, and, and it didn't. It was like amazing. It's a miracle. It is a, it's a freaking miracle. That, uh, and that's evidence. You know, I need so much evidence because I forget it immediately. You know, I'll, I'll get it. I'll, I'll get some, some proof that there's a power working besides my power, and then um, something will happen and, and I'll forget it. And so it's like I'm just trying to work on, you know, 
holding the evidence a little bit longer, a little bit closer with some some power besides myself. Uh, you know, it's such it's it's really really important for me to um, stick close. I, uh, <clears throat> Shaquith has been calling me the, like the last couple of weeks or whatever, like, like, and he's been like calling at these crazy exact right moments. <clears throat> Whether he's saying the right thing or the wrong same thing, it's just like another alcoholic. Because <clears throat> I'm not, I'm kind of a will not. I still don't pick. I, I just don't remember. You can just pick up the phone. I don't remember that. Like I'll sit there and reach a little momentary bottom and like uh, get ready to say I'm screwed. And I, and I think I still, there's this big list. I mean, I've got all these great people I can call, but I, I can't, I still can't make the decision which one is. I, it's still selfish. It's still like, like I'm still not doing it. So <clears throat> can you talk maybe a little bit about, uh, you talk about the service that you do. Uh, like wherever you are in the steps, whether you're on the first step or the 12th step, whatever, like how, how do you, get into the service so you can get out of your head and get out of your bed and and, <laughs> and 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 have a good day by helping somebody besides putting yourself down. You want to just talk about that? You want? I love what you said about like you don't know who to call, right? So so I'll just expose my mind to you and see if it fits, right? I'm not gonna call you because I'm smarter than you anyway, and I already know all this, and I read all of this, and I don't trust you anyway. And you don't care about me anyway, and I'm just doomed anyway, so why bother? I mean, if we really want to get honest, that's why we don't pick up the phone. Or another version of that called you don't really care about me anyway, and I don't want to bother you because I'm completely worthless, right? It's just some version of all of that, right? So remember what I shared earlier. i got to get out of my feelings and my thoughts, and i got to get into the principle, right? So what's the principle? It is suggested here. If I want to stay sober and I'm committed to that one day at a time, i got to do what's suggested of me here. And what it's suggested of me here is that I call a sponsor. Right? So I don't have to think about who to call because who I call is my sponsor. My sponsor is always my first call. When my mind is attacking me with the baseball bat, my sponsor is always my first call. You know? And, uh, and I call my sponsor. And if I can't get a hold of my sponsor and I'm really not okay and I'm on my knees and I'm in a panic attack and I can't get out of self, then I call, you know, whoever the next person is on my line. But I have a lineup that I've already prepared because I'm prepared. You know, like if you, you have the dope dealer, you don't have just one coke dealer. You know, you're prepared. You know, if that guy's in Vegas, you got, you know, plan B, right? So y'all can't, it's just like how committed are you to stay sober, right? You know, like if I, I don't know about some people that they do all this pain stuff and somehow they're here for 20 years. I would blow my brains out. I can't do it. When I get into pain, it's so painful, I want to die. You know, I can't do whatever that is. You know, I would drink or I would kill myself. You know, there's no way for me. So, you know, I pick up the phone. I always call my sponsor first. And my sponsor is pretty amazing about getting back to me really expediently. And if it's an, it's an emergency and I really need to talk to somebody and I feel not okay, I'll text that person. You know, I'll leave a voice note and I'll text. And if I don't hear back within a reasonable amount of time, I'll go to my next and my next. You know what I mean? But as I said from the beginning, I have a whole treatment team, guys. You know, I mean, it takes a village for this alcoholic, you know, one day at a time. So like that. And then service, you know, uh, as picking up the phone always, never saying no to an AA request, going to all my meetings, you know, showing up and making appointments to work with my girls, you know, and, and always thinking about somebody else or cleaning something up in the house or at the meeting or at work or whatever it is. But I also schedule myself. If anybody in this room saw my calendar, you'd be amazed that one human being can do that many things, right? But it's because guess what? If I'm not doing those things, guess what I'm doing? I'm in some gutter in my mind about how it's all going to not be okay or my plans, right, you know? And I don't want to sit there in plans or in doom, right? So i got to be scheduled. So you're going to find me. There's only a couple places you'll ever find me in any given day. You'll find me at work, or you'll find me at a meeting, or you'll find me with sponsees, or you'll find me cleaning, or you'll find me shopping and doing chores, or you'll find me sleeping. Really. That's pretty much where you'll find me. Occasional movie. But mostly that's where you'll find me. Because guess what? The moment I'm not doing one of those things, dun, 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 you know, I'm either in plans or I'm in, you know, I'm going to die. That's, the, that's just like I'm keeping it so real, you guys. This disease is not a joke, and there's no easier, softer way. 
You know, there's just not. You know, I had somebody tell me the other day, sponsor or something. She was like, you know, oh, it's just not so much work. Okay. Yeah, well, then I don't know what to tell you. I mean, getting the way you were living was a lot of work, too. It was pretty dramatic looking for your car, cleaning up the vomit, taking AIDS tests. You know, it's a lot of work, too, right? Wondering, you know, what it's all about. You know, really, I told somebody else the other day, your bottom is coming. You know, the abortion, the HIV, the herpes, you know, the jail, the, the vehicular manslaughter. Oh, it's waiting for us all. You know what I mean? It's not a joke, you guys. It's not a joke. I heard this one woman share one time that she had um, had only drank and had never done drugs, and she had like six years of sobriety, and then she went out, and then she was arrested for prostitution for crack and ended up in jail. And she'd been an executive and thought like, oh, that'll never happen to me, right? You know, I got to get humble and know that I'm not above any of this. Just because I've never done whatever, dot, 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 doesn't mean it ain't waiting for me if I be so careless about my state of mind. Because the disease is centered in my mind, right? Every feeling starts with a thought. I have a thought, and then I engage the thought, I indulge the thought, and then the feeling emerges, and then the feeling emerges, and then the action comes, right? Uh, it's a danger zone, man. i got to stop the thought before it gets there. And i got to call my sponsor. i got to call my support team. i got to get into action, contrary action. And that's if my life is important to me. My sobriety matters to me. Thank you. Who's next? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chutney and I'm an alcoholic. I have alcoholism. I learned that from Judy. I love that. I'm I have alcoholism, it's not who I am. It's it's just a small part of me. It's not who I am. And I love that distinction. Happy birthday, Dawn and Jose. Jose saw me come in. It's special to me. Um you know, um I asked my sponsor the, one of the questions in our format, so why do we keep coming to Alcoholics Anonymous? Why should I come? Why should I keep coming? And she goes, well, how many old-timers have you known who have killed themselves? And I'm like, wow, that's the answer. That's the answer. And so, Jose and Don, uh, it's so important that you're here. It's so important that you're here. You know, it is. It's a lot. It's a testament, you know, to this program and, and your higher power. Um, there's a lot of stuff being said tonight about um, self-esteem and beating ourselves up, and we all do it. We're all really good at it. We're experts at thrashing ourselves into little pieces. We're experts at it, you know. And um, so I asked my sponsor when I first got sober, I said, you know, I'm, I just feel so bad about myself. I just hate myself. I don't know what to do. I'm just always hating on myself. And she goes, oh, Chutney. Oh, baby. Oh, Chut. You know, it's not, it's, it's not that you hate yourself. That's not the problem. It's that you're always thinking about yourself. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, what? What? Oh, God, I'm always saying that's so true. I'm always sitting around thinking about myself. Self, 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 me, 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 I, 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 me some more, and I some more, me, me, me. And, um, and that has always stuck with me, you know. And, and, um, and, the, and so I come here and I learn a lot about the ego, and I love all this stuff we learn about the ego because it's applicable. It's not a theory. It's not a nice idea. It's an application. And one of the applications is, is that, you know, pride in reverse is all that beating up. You know, that all that self-mutilation that we do uh, is egotistical behavior. That's the news. That's the news because the flip side of the thrashing and the hating is I'm so great. Me, I'm the best and the smartest. I am above you all, right? I'm better than you. My value as a person is more than you. I'm more valuable than you are. That's the opposite. That's the flip side of the same coin. So just remember that, you guys. You know? <laughs> when you're down there beating yourself to shreds, you're an egomaniac. What do they say? We're like, 
have a superiority complex. Uh, what is it? What's the thing? I'm an ego. Inferiority complex. Thank you. An egomaniac with an inferiority complex. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Because that's me. That's so me. And and so you know, I just I just wanted to put that little reminder out. You know, next time you're observing the thoughts and the ways of your brain, and you're observing yourself being beating yourself up, just say, "Oh, I'm in my ego." You know, and it. Oh, I'm in my alcoholism. You know, it helped me. So thank you. Hi, I'm Walter. I'm an alcoholic. Oh, man, uh, been having a interesting uh, time. You know, yesterday I was, um, I'm in sales and I drive like hours to a uh, sales lead and I get really attached to getting it, right, getting what I came for. And um, they sent me out like on this really long drive and I was passing these orchards and I had, like, I was having this fantasy of sharing. I was having this fantasy of sharing <laughs> um, of how I was going to share about how good I was. Somebody have a black Mercedes parked out here, they do a tour. Park right out of this parking lot. Black Mercedes? <laughs> 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 okay. So anyway, um, yeah, and I was like uh, having this thought of having this share about how good I was about not stealing any of these oranges. And I'm like patting myself on the back and sharing about it in my mind. And as soon as I turn the corner, um, I see where all these oranges had been picked, but there's one tree that they forgot. And I pulled over, and then I'm coming with these two, uh, I go into the orchard, and I come out with these two oranges, and now there's cars that see me stealing these oranges. <laughs> and I feel like crap. And it was like, man, how great I was, and then, you know, I don't even know how that all happened. <laughs> You know, like how I could go from that to this. And I'm like, man, well, then now I feel guilt and remorse. Like, what can I do now? I'll just eat the oranges. But, you know, that was, I was okay, well, you know, maybe I can uh, give something to someone. But then I go to the uh, to the lead, and it didn't go good. And um, I had this situation where I couldn't uh, calculate things that I needed to calculate because I couldn't get Wi-Fi. So now my boss tells me to drive two hours back to my hotel, figure that out, and they told me they're not even interested in doing anything, like buying anything. They told me straight, oh, we're just kicking tires. And then so now I have to drive two hours back the next day, and then two hours back to my, that's eight hours driving for nothing. So I went all into self-pity and uh, resentment, and I was just like in this world of hurt, man. I was just like, damn. And then, bam, I got it right there. I'm going to call my uh, buddy. But anyway, he's uh, he's an alcoholic, and he's in self-will, and we're all doing this uh, commiserating together about how terrible it is that they're doing this to us. So then the bottom line was all of this pain and suffering. When I started driving home, I started to get it again. Like, okay, this is not the answer. Call him that guy. So, um the bottom line was like, man, today, I, uh, and even last night, I decided, whoa, I got to just do something different. So I did this meditation, prayed, and I got back into the center, um, what works for me. And I got up this morning and I asked God how to be useful. And I didn't do that the day before, that day that I was suffering. And it was amazing. I'm driving back from Bakersfield, and all of a sudden I had an inspirational thought that maybe I could call my old sponsee and work with him. And, you know, because he didn't do it the way I liked him to do it. So I was like, you know, I threw him away. And it was like, I've got this this thing that I ordered, uh, the big book comes awake or whatever, and I haven't touched it. And it came with two workbooks, 
my sponsor said it's only supposed to come with one. And I was like, you know, and I called him and I offered it to him. And it was just like I had this. Now you were talking about that like this when the paradox, when, when, when I'm out there trying to get mine, man, that's a terrible, terrible place. Mm-hmm. And then when I'm, when I shift that to, and I didn't, and I didn't do that. It was from praying and asking that I had that gift of like, wow, man, like this wonderful feeling inside. And I had a, I didn't have any uh, results in sales this week. But, you know, just having that conversation, when I left that conversation with my sponsee, it just felt like, man, that was it right there. That's what I'm looking for. You know, that feeling. Because even if I would have made a sale or whatever, I don't get that. So, that's all. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sharon. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Hi, Sharon. Thank you so much for everything you said, and I related to so much you said. Happy birthday, you guys. Jose, I love the passion. Um, you know, there's a couple things you said that I really heard, and you said, you know, you have to live this message, this program, you have to breathe it, or, or that you do, and, and I really get that, because um, for me, for a long time, it was all about sobriety, how much time I have, and, and adding another candle to that cake, and where I'm speaking at, or whatever, I never really lived this program, I would go to meetings, and I would do a lot of this stuff, and I would say the right thing, and I would all of it, all of the program, I would I would tell you the big book, and I would just memorize the entire thing, but I never really got what it meant because I wasn't applying it. Um, you know, what I knowledge of elders nothing. It says in the book, and it really it doesn't. And so, application for me, it's huge today. Um, you know, Cat talks about building a new character. Well, Bob Anderson talks about building a new character, but but Kat talks about, you know, at at every moment that I'm standing here, I'm building a character, whether I know it or not, Um, and that this character is being built with self or it's being built with God, and I get to choose which one I want to go with, and a lot of times I clearly choose self, and that there's nothing wrong with that, Um, but the fact is that I know that I'm choosing pain. Uh, almost like I, I would rather have that, and it and it stays as long as it stays in, until I'm until I am done with it, and I want solution. Um, so for me, you know, I I just I love this program, I love AA, but it's specifically this format because it's it's taught me not only to believe in God, but have a relationship with Him because I believed in God since I was a little kid but to really build a relationship with this power on a momentary basis, on a daily basis. It was like a completely new concept for me. I didn't even know. I thought that you have to be in church and you have to be on your knees and you have to be this way and that way. But that's not true for me. Um, I get to talk to God all day long, Um, literally all day long. A lot of times I just have to stop and just say in my mind, as I'm in a conversation even, in my mind I just have to say, can you just help me listen to this person? Can you just stand here with me? Can you just help me for the next few minutes, not judge and not whatever? Like, I literally have to have these small conversations with God. And when I'm sad or lonely or whatever, um, the solutions that I would seek before, such as relationships or this and that and shopping, you know, I'm willing to be uncomfortable today. That's huge. You know, I'm willing to sit with not being comfortable until it gets comfortable, mm-hmm. like you talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really what AA is about for me. It's not about how much time I have. It's about what I'm doing, who I'm being in the day that I'm in. Um, and, and so the character building is, is what I, I'm seeking in this program, not so, much, uh, not so much of the time or the status or whatever that is. Yeah. Ah, thank you so much. I'm Jesse. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jesse. Thank you. I love hearing you talk like all the time. Whenever you share, I always get 
so much out of it and happy birthday to the birthday people and, and uh, welcome to anyone who's, who's new. And, um, you know, my sponsor tells me that like every, everything I do, every action I take is either taking one step towards or one step away from a drink. So I really have to, you know, like watch myself, question my motives. Why am I doing this? Am I doing this because I want to get my way? Am I doing this because it's good for the other person, you know, which, you know, who knows if it'll work out well for me or not. Um, and I do call my sponsor every single day, even at three, three years, you know, over three years, because it's just, it gets me in that um, place of like a habit. So the phone's not so heavy when I need to pick it up. It's just automatic, you know. I call my sponsor every day, and I call three other sober women every day. Um, because when I need to, I don't even think about it. I just pick it up and dial without even thinking. Um, anyways, I did want to ask you a question. I know in the program we do talk about a lot about humility, and it's in the step, humbly asking to remove our shortcomings, step seven, um, which is kind of, you know, going through the steps again, and that's where I'm at. And, and I was reading this quote today, and it said, um, you know, humility is a very strange thing because once we notice that we have it, it's gone. So that really got me thinking, like, okay, well, how do I get humble, like, without being arrogant about being humble? Um, so I kind of wanted to get your, your view on that. <laughs> Humility is willing to be nothing. When I'm just being with you, and it's not about me, that's humility. And what I'm present to in that moment is not my humility, but my nothingness, and I'm present to you. And whatever your need is and how to meet your need. That's humility. See, the ego wants to be somebody. i got to be somebody because I'm not okay. Right? I'm not okay. It's just me alone, I'm separate, I'm small, I'm abandoned, I'm harmed. And unless I be somebody big, you know, then I'm going to be little and hurt. And that's not safe, right? But when I'm with God and I'm with my higher power, I know that it's, it's the Father that deals the work, not me, right? Like, whatever, it doesn't matter, Buddhist, Christian, whatever, or the Buddha that do the work or the whoever. But, you know, it's God, not me, right? Like, my heart is dying in my chest right now. It's not me making that happen. I'm not sitting here making that happen, right? So, so when I'm with the power and I'm just with you, I disappear. And all there is is you and how to meet your need. And God comes into the picture and miracles happen. And that's where the magic happens, you know? And that's where humility lives. You know, it's about me being willing to be nothing. And that's when I get to be everything for you and for me. I think that's all the time we have. Where's Ron, our secretary? Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.